Pathway Studios in Johnston proper. You are live from the path. And you're listening to Live from the Past, coming from the Pathway Studios here in Johnston proper. Oh, there we go. It's good to be with you this uh, this fine evening. Here we go. There's there's a it's a special show. Uh, I was abandoned. I was abandoned by nearly everyone. But, but well, no, actually everybody. So if you think of all the folks you're used to hearing on the on the show here, old uh, uh, Mike, Dan, Buva, and Nathaniel. Every one of them at least uh, made the case that they had something better going on this evening. So here's here's what we're going to do. I, we've got something special set up for you. Uh, Emma Emma Foost is in studio. Hi, Emma. Hello. Okay, so Emma has, has been on the program before, and what we've decided to do is we're just going to give you a, a taste of a program. And so the format is one big question. One big question and probably like three three advices. And then we're going to cut you loose. Okay, so you just get a little bit of a tickle, a little tangle of life from the path uh, just to keep your week going. And then uh, and then we'll catch up with the full show with all the fellas here. Uh, I don't know, whenever they show up, I guess. Okay, seem like that seemed like a good format, Emma. Sounds pretty good to me. Okay, so did you have you landed on your big question? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily big, but I think it's the best I'm going to be able to come up with. So, okay, so I'll go first. Okay. And and then. Why did you don't don't feel like you have to rethink your question, okay? But I'll go first with the big big question. So and it's okay if the answer to this question is not yet or I'm not sure, okay? But my question is you are uh about to turn 17. Mm-hmm. Is there a time where you felt like your faith became yours, not just something that you had learned about or that your parents or people in your community or family had, do you feel like you've had the experience that you can remember where your, your faith yeah, became something that belonged to you or that you experienced as opposed to just something you knew about that was given to you? I would say yes, it has happened. And, but the problem, I feel like it's happened multiple times. Well, that's all right. So like, like, I don't know, every, it's not like it's consistent or routine, but like it was something will happen or I'll be doing something or like I'll really see God move or like I'll just even start feeling closer. And then I'll be like, I don't know. I really don't, I don't know when it started the first time. Yeah. But I do know like there are times where I will definitely feel like this is more like I'm, this is my faith right now. Like I am. God is working with me, yep. talking directly to me. Like it's not, my mom is not telling me it. My dad's not telling me it. Yeah. My friends aren't telling me it like this. I, I can see it for myself. And so I don't know if I can really pinpoint any of those times. Yeah. Like there's little, little places where I've seen God move, obviously. But um, a big one, I did the experiencing God study. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it was last summer, actually, um, with some friends and their mom. and. That has been, I feel like, a really good point of reference um, because it it just it completely changes the way you think about experiencing God. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of like it's the main premise is God is always moving. You yeah. just have to be able to see it. Yep. And so it really adds like that just completely, I think, really shifted when I'm thinking about it and remembering that it completely shifts how you view the world and how God is moving because it's not I wonder, will God work in this right or i wonder if god is watching or listening or caring or whatever like he is yeah that's just the truth you just have to be able to see it which really makes a lot more sense because obviously we are not the perfect beings in this equation yeah so it makes more sense that we are the ones at fault not being able to see what is happening yeah um but it's also like you can't make yourself see it you um you have to let god help you see it yeah and so Going through that study and probably learning that and thinking about that and remembering that various times has was a a big one. Yeah, yeah. 
That makes sense to me. I was I was trying to think back whether I could I knew of this that experience for myself. And like I tend to I tend to be very I know harsh isn't the right word, but like like I always I always think back to like well what did I believe when I was like 25? <laughs> and like I it's just funny. I'll listen to past shows and I'll say something just in our conversation on life in the path. I'm like, "Oh, well that that's actually pretty right. I just presumed that 8 years ago I was an idiot." Yeah. <laughs> um, but like I I don't I do think that up it was probably well into my twenties, late twenties, that where I felt like the my faith transitioned to something that I it wasn't just something I knew about because like I, I think that's how it starts right like mm-hmm. you we start teaching you facts things that are true and that's okay like at an age there's a certain age where like you can only handle we just have to say this is how you're supposed to take the world in and that's I think that's totally fine but like. Sometimes, uh, in fact, this is a thing that, that causes problems is that if our faith does not transfer into something that we otherwise experience, um, then when presented with facts that are deeper or alternative to the facts that we learned growing up, it, it puts the question of God and, and who he is and whether he exists as if it's a totally reasonable thing to consider. But if you have experienced it, if you have interacted with, if you've seen the Holy Spirit move in your life, if outside of someone like curating and explaining to you something that happened and you have to lean on it in a situation, like then then some of the types of things that we feel like that people bail from Christianity on aren't super compelling. Like it just means you, it makes you look at it and go, okay, there has to be an explanation for this because I cannot explain away the situation that I saw. Or the interaction that I that I felt, or like just the clarity of which I've seen God move and act, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say, like I I always had um, from growing up, I, I had this foundation that like, okay, this is how I'm supposed to look at the world. But like, you probably could have pressed pretty hard on that, and I wasn't you. I wasn't living anything that would say um, this transition to something that I that was mine. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I I it was it's just interesting. It's interesting to think about like whether there are it's I, I like your answer actually because like it like it's not just one moment um and it's probably not something where, like it's it's very um to look back on it and go when was the moment most people don't when something unique like that happens you don't go oh I actually own my faith now like it's yeah. not something we tend to think about and so and I'm glad that I'm glad that study helped I've heard that from a lot of from a lot of people. Um, and I think you're right. I think there is something very com- like interesting about we if we interact with God as facts and as if we're pressing the buttons, we actually don't tend to see the same things if we go, look, we are – God is, is working and moving, and then we get to see it and experience it. You're right. That makes – it's more logical. It makes way more sense that way. Um, and then I think we don't miss out on things because we didn't prescribe what had to happen. We were just opening to what could be happening. Yeah. And so like even – if I think back to when I got baptized, which was almost four years ago, yeah, I remember. I know that I believed what, pretty much what I believe now. Then I believed, yeah, God's my savior. He's real. Jesus loves me. Like the basic questions you get asked. Like I believed yep. all of it, and I can't really remember a time where I didn't. Yeah, but like if I think about who I was and the things I was thinking and doing, then I was like, wow, that's terrible. How could you even? <laughs> was what was wrong with you? Yeah, like. And when I'm in four more years, I'm sure I'll think about that yes. about myself now. Yes. And so, and like, even though I've done that Bible study over a full year ago, like I still pray like I haven't. Like I'll yeah. pray like, God, will you bless this situation or God, will you move here or will you do this? And the way I pray, I don't know. I'm trying to work on this and I'm not really sure how to fix it, but I always tack on like, if it's your will, of course, like that's going to help things <laughs> because I don't want to seem like I'm pressuring God into doing things. Yeah. Which and then it just feels fake because it is, but yeah, yeah. Anyways, like then I pray, I still pray like, "Will you do this?" Instead of like, "Will you let me see this?" And it's it's like a, it's so much more freedom when you're, when you're just like when you pray, "God, will you let me see this?" Because it's not on you, and it doesn't have any of the consequences like the same consequences where like, "Oh, God didn't do what I asked him to." Yeah, he did stuff. You just didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah, or or he solved it in a different way, or yeah. it wasn't the time, and it wasn't the thing you wanted. 
wasn't what was best for you or for somebody else or something like that. I think that gets to something that we had we'd talked about at church recently, which was around kind of having a hesitance of like, if you've asked God for to act or move in a certain way. And like the thing that you're asking feels righteous. Like it feels like a totally awesome thing to pray for. It's not like you're praying, like, can I have a million dollars? Like, can you heal these people? Can you mend these relationships? Can you make, uh, I remember I was praying recently over um, like a contested piece of property. And I'm like, this, this ground was not meant to be split. Can you like have humans recognize the unity of the ground that you created, you know? Um, and those are righteous things, but it doesn't mean that they're going to happen. And like it, it puts our evaluation of God in a weird spot where like if you don't do the thing that I asked, then I start questioning your character. But like it's it's totally normal because that's how you would interact with anybody else. Like the, the thing is, is most humans just you don't have that level of trust for your other humans. Like it's it would be very difficult to be like, you know, even if the thing, the basic good, like why are there people starving in all all over the world? Why is there mass violence allowed? Why are people allowed to sully the name of Jesus acting ways if they're acting on his behalf you know like why well, god isn't doing something or other um if you would not trust any other human to be like well i know all these things are happening but like he, you know chuck must have a plan <laughs> you just don't trust people like that yeah it's a different relationship with god and so interestingly i think it's actually still totally appropriate to say god i'm we're asking for your blessing on the situation we're asking for you know we're going to anoint with oil and we're yeah. like as a physical means of saying can we can you give your blessing to this specific situation? Like, I think that's still okay. Um, but it, it says like, like you would ask a father, you would say, dad, can you help me with this? And sometimes your dad will say, or my dad would say, you know, well, yes, but I'm not going to do the thing that you're asking or, or no, there's more things going on. You don't quite understand, but I need you to trust me. And, and, and if you do, then you're like, okay, that's good. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is. It's it's always an interesting thing because one, we trust God to be God, but then God says, "I want you to ask." And so, not having human expectations on the things that we ask, but having God relationship, trustworthy expectations, allows us to be free to say, "God, I, I want this is the thing that I want." You, it feels like you've put it on my heart, and, and this could you interact in this situation? But being cautious, I think to your point of not boxing God in and saying this is the only way in which it's okay to be solved, like. Uh, a most a vast majority of people who follow Jesus, like the stories I've heard is like they've prayed for something and God almost never answers it in the way that they believed he would, yeah. but did it better or differently. And so like sometimes we miss being able to see it simply because we were only agreed to to watch out for one thing. Say, God, send a red car. I want a, I want a red car. And, um, you know, and if, if these cars are just flying by and one of them's a red SUV and that God could have sent that one. <laughs> and I ignored it because I said, well, I wanted I was looking for a red car, you know. OK, okay. do you want me to do my question? OK, yeah, yeah. Hit me one question. OK, so I had a different one. And then while we were talking, I thought of this and then I forgot it a few times and then I really remembered it. <laughs> OK. Um, do you ever feel um, afraid to pray because of what could happen, like because of what you could put into motion? And then how do you how do you get out of that cycle? Yes. Yes. I think I have had hesitance to pray on multiple occasions. So I have prayed at um, – and this sticks with me. Um, it, it feels like I was in the same room multiple times. But after my kids were born, so after you were born, after um, my other kids were born, I remember – for each of you, I, I was in like a bedroom or something and like I was trying to give my wife a rest. And so I was like trying to put a baby to sleep. And this is every every time it was within like a week of being born. And I remember praying, God, I, I trust this child to you. And there was like a hesitance in me, not because I don't trust the child to God, but there was a weight of recognizing that like sometimes accomplishing God's purposes puts all kinds of human situations at risk, right? So you might look out and like, you know, if there's an idealized version of of your life, it's 20 years from now, um, my kids and my grandkids like are all together on some sort of holiday and like it's very peaceful and loving and we just get to like the fruits of an attempted life well lived is in front of you. And then one of those kids isn't there and uh they don't have to be dead they might just be gone or something like but like they're not there and there's no grandkids 
And that's all awesome because they're following Jesus and doing something or other here or there. But like there's a weight to that, right? Because like I took the curation of my children's lives or what I believed that I could influence on my kids' lives and I said, I trust you with this human being, with this, with this child. And like I remember when you were born, as a matter of fact, it hit me very hard. I thought like – where am I leading this child? Like, do I really believe the things that I believe? Because if these are, if this is not true, I don't want to set this person up for like believing all kinds of things that aren't right, it, that cause social rubs with people and um, things that the society around us doesn't particularly love. And they're sacrificial things or things you don't, we don't do that the rest of society is like, well, it seems all right. Um, it it separates who you get to date and how you date and how you marry and the things that you do. And so, like, I remember thinking that, like, it's one thing if I've accepted the consequence of this thing I believe that is a faith thing, but, I, you know, you can't prove some of it. It's a whole nother thing to what feels like indoctrinate somebody. Like, you, like most of your children, like, they're going to – if you teach them something, that's how they're going to view the world. And plenty of people have screwed up their kids doing that, right? And so it just felt very heavy to me at the time. And so I was praying, <laughs> praying about that. But now, like, here's the thing. It's, it's always kind of the right thing because the second part of your question was, am I ever afraid? The answer is yes. Um, but they're human level fears. And it's the thing, like, in, in the presence of that, um, they, most of them have been righteous things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a counterexample here in a second. Most of them have been righteous things where, like, it was the the only thing I could do was pray about it and go forward with the prayer because mm-hmm. I knew that whatever hesitance existed, it existed um, uh, at a human level, but that God was the right person to handle it anyway. Mm-hmm. Okay, there have been situations where like I didn't want to, I didn't want to admit something, I didn't want to tell somebody I did something or something that I thought or something that I, I don't know. I, I don't remember what it was, probably multiple things where like I was embarrassed of myself or ashamed of how I acted or said something or something. And so like I didn't want to pray it because I didn't want God to make it obvious that I had to go make amends to this thing. And so, um, I mean, obviously, again, like I know that's dumb, like I, but like it's, but it's a human thing that goes, look, maybe I don't have to, maybe there's another route of which I don't have to do this thing that I don't want to do. Um, every time that I've, prayed into that it is it is provided freedom it is on the other side like the reason it was on my mind is because the thing was weighing on me and because i knew it was something that needed reconciled and whatever the hard moment was on the other side of that thing there was actual freedom to it and 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 um a a healing of a relationship or a situation that i probably needed to to fix anyway and so, but I have been cautious about praying with it because I, if like, if don't ask, don't tell, like if I didn't ask, maybe God wouldn't affirm that, yes, you totally need to, to do that. And so, yes, yes, that has happened to me. Do you, do you feel like, have you run into those situations? Definitely. Both. <laughs> like there's, yeah. Um, like for example, there was, I was about last year, I think. And, um, some of my friends that I'd grown up with. We didn't see each other as much. And like, I was praying, uh, all the time, like, God, can you bless this relationship? Mm -hmm. And there was this fear. Like, what if that means I'm just, no, I'm not friends with them anymore. Like I'm, I just have to let them go. Yes. And like, ultimately that's what happened. Like I'm still friends with them and I I still care about them and they're still great. But like, I ultimately through various circumstances ended up letting them go as saying like, you guys are not as close to me as you once were. I'm not as close to you. And like, that's okay. Yeah. And like it has, it did provide a lot of relief. Yeah. And then there've been times where like in your, in your contrast example, where I've prayed things in the back of my mind, as I pray, it's like, well, what if that means you have to say this? Yeah. Um, but then there've been times when I've prayed that same prayer and in the back of my mind is what if that means you have to say this, but like, I have said those things. Yeah. And so it's hard for me to tell sometimes like, is that my personal guilt? Like yeah. holding on, or is that God nudging me? Like it's I yeah, know. yeah, totally. Actually, I, it, it's um. Well, here's here's the thing that I generally believe to be true is that like um, oh, there's almost like there's always freedom in like in honesty. Like they're just holding things back, like holding things back in protection. There, I, there is a there is a means of which you know um. 
you don't need to uh, unleash yourself upon someone else uh, to relieve your burden only to pass it on somebody. Yeah. Um, but like in the right relationships, the right trusted relationships, like um, anytime you hold something back, you're holding part of yourself back. There's always something where like um, it's it's not it doesn't feel like dishonesty, but it is like a uh, well, here's part of me that you don't get to see. And it tends to be things that are harmful that, that are, don't look good on us. Um, or something, frankly, that's hard, that is going rough with someone else. And like, you don't want to risk making them mad or upset with you or something, but you're, but like, do I care about, do I care about them enough to say it? Because, um, that's where their freedom is. And then do I care about enough about my relationship with each other and my relationship with God to share something that is hard so that I have the, the freedom that God calls me to. And so like almost always in the right and right trusted relationships, like openness is better than not um but i i I also and i think we talked about this in the show before sometimes i struggle where like i'll pray on something and immediately something happens in my mind and i feel like oh that's the answer and then not just a quarter of a second later the exact opposite thing pops right into my head and both are kind of in my mind voice does that make sense when i say my Mm -hmm. mind voice um and so i'm like come on how can i sort this out (laughs) like this thing is against me whatever's in with underneath my brain underneath my brain bones is against me because I can't I'm trying to sort out and ask the Lord for things and immediately there's just like it's like the angel devil yeah. <laughs> like cartoon example I'm like what I can't sort it out this way so I always have to pray like can you tell my wife to or can you just send somebody else because I feel like my innards are not particularly trustworthy and I just need you to affirm <laughs> whatever this is you know yeah. and I do I feel like I can tell sometimes like there's a certain feeling I've gone every time there's something I like I need to say something I need to tell somebody something and it's like it, it's almost like it fills my head like it gets like my head is three times heavier than it's supposed to be mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's almost like fuzzy feeling inside yep and that won't happen sometimes sometimes that will happen but i'll still just feel like Ugh, right i feel terrible yeah and then there are times where like i've i don't know how long i've thought this and it's i don't i don't know if i truly believe it but it's like my basic instincts are based always on reverse psychology oh so like <laughs> as soon as i I think, but it, not always, because sometimes it's only in the bad situations. So then I'll, I'll think, I'll be, we'll just be doing something random, and I'll think, oh, you know what could happen? Like something good. And yeah. This could happen, and then my brain goes, you know what? Now you've messed it up because you've thought it could happen, <laughs> and now it will not. Right. But then when everything, whenever I think about something bad that will happen, your my brain goes, well, now you've thought about it, now it's gonna happen. Uh-huh. And it's just, it's terrible. It's uh-huh. a cycle, and I don't know if that's what's like gets me into pessimistic thinking, mm-hmm. which also affects like my fear when I'm praying because it'll be like so completely something that does not really matter or that I'm praying about, or something will happen, and I pray about it, and then my mind instantly goes to the worst. Yeah. Like when we were, well, me and my mom recently went on a mission trip and before the mission trip, she was like that we were like the few days before we were sitting in like a drive through getting something, some, some, something, I can't remember what. And she was playing a song. She's like, this song's really been on my heart and it's about worshiping through like adversity and through, and through sorrow. Yeah. I wonder if it means somebody close to me is going to get hurt or die. <laughs> and A, that was a terrible thing. <laughs> to tell me yeah it was terrible yeah and then and then i thought my instantly my brain goes well what if that's for me yeah what if it's it's not for mom what if it's for me yeah and then we're gonna go on this trip and mom's gonna die and i'm gonna have to be like build myself through it it's gonna be terrible yeah 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 it's it, it that's actually gets a little bit to the question of um of leaning on your faith because like or or, or, or or i think to your, to your first question for me which is the praying because you're like, uh, I don't want to build character. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm right here. I just, I want to, I don't, I don't want to have to go through the perseverance to build character. And so, like, you're looking ahead. But, like, again, they become, at its best, if we say, like, God, if God is good, then I have to trust that whatever these things, I, I think, maybe this is where we get tied up a little bit, is, that like, like, sometimes, sometimes we apply them in such a way as if God's only purpose is to do something harsh so that we can build yeah. character. And I don't think that's the context of what Paul is getting at. It's it's like I trust wholeheartedly and this what stems what creates my fear is that I trust that God is powerful enough to enact these things. But I I don't trust, I think, where that he's good enough that the good will come out of it. Or that the mm. uh 
or I don't trust enough that like this will he does actually know what's best. I just trust his power. So I I believe he will do things and I believe things yeah. will happen. But my and if if you asked, I would say yeah, I I trust him. I trust that he's good. I think he's I think he's good. I've seen him work yep. and do great things. But when I'm praying, the fear is like, well, what if it's not? What I don't what if I what if his standards like his god moving is not actually as good as the human human good and what if it brings oh yeah 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 because the only thing you can know and touch and taste and feel whatever is the human good and so it's very difficult well that's the whole god story isn't it like to look around and god says look there is something not there's glimpses of what god said was good that he created that was good that's around us right so it's not like it's completely hey there's something completely wild and different from this but everything that we say everything that we believe to be good here is like a million times better in uh, once redeemed, yeah. once free of all the things that shackle it, right? And so, but it is something that we still await. And so, I, frankly, this is this that's the root of the things that tempt people. Like, uh, I could uh, I'm trying to think of an appropriate example here. So, like, it's it's waiting for the thing that is good and trusting that it's that it's coming. When otherwise you could just fill whatever earthly need that you have right now. Um, and then as earthly as those those short sighted decisions pile up, they end up in a crappier and crappier life. But they're only so but that's only crappier by comparison. Otherwise, it might be just living your life, your human life to the fullest if there yeah. was not a better. Right. And so. Right. It goes back to the uh, praying that like, do I really believe this? Because the consequence to one of my kids might be they defer all what feels like the world has to offer in anticipation of this promise. But if that promise was bogus, what kind of life did I set my kid up for? You know? Yeah. And so and it's, so it, it, but even holding on to that myself and and saying, do I trust that? Like if everything around me from a worldly perspective crumbled today do I trust that God is is still good and that he can be trusted with whatever circumstance I'm in? I think this is the thing about where we live and the amount of money that is around us in our culture. I think we are more prone to blindness in that area than people who have – well, the same thing Jesus would say, like the poor – good news is brought to the poor. The poor is the only one who's listening. Yeah. You're e more easily blinded by, well, what if I give up this earthly goodness because you actually have – we bought our own blindness with our affluence. You know? Yeah, and usually it's not even things that like. I think the like the real fears are not things that p some people are on the fence about or people have debates over. Like, yeah. do I really believe that g like goodness comes from marrying one person and staying with them and like of opposite gender? Yeah, I believe that. That's yeah. that's basic. I like the, I have no doubts about that. Yeah. Or do I really believe that like helping people who need it will bring good? Yeah. Yes, I do. But like. Do I believe that, um, and like, even if you say like, do, do you believe that, um, suffering and stuff will build your character yeah. and losing people will grow you and change you? Yeah. I, I do also believe that, but do I believe that suffering and going through hard things and losing people is worth the good that comes out of it? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, like, that's the struggle. Oh no. I think that's totally, I think that's legit. And I, I think that is a if there's a relief in there it's not like god is arbitrary going i want to grow emma i'm going to kill her uncle you know what i'm saying like that is that i i want some perseverance this is how i'm going to get it yeah i think it is more god is going look i even through human suffering or human um things that are just reality of the human existence um he can use those for good not necessarily that he's that he's like purchasing perseverance by, you yeah. know, you, right. And like that's a that's that's a trust of God as a um, it's it's so difficult because like you're right in the in the God's power and sovereignty, he can do whatever he wants. But I don't it's not really in his character. This is Paul looking at and going even in the midst of human frailties. Um, here's here's the way that we can see it that helps us understand God's character rightly. I think sometimes where we miss it is like we start with this character in that situation going like, like the I think that gives us a, a skewed view of it as if he's like, I need to teach Emma a lesson. Yeah. And that's and that that I think is not reflective of, of his character. As a matter of fact, anytime that God is 
trying to use what what we might consider a disadvantage to um, change human behavior. It's almost always a call to repentance, to turn mm-hmm. from things that are harming you, not to introduce um, not to introduce something that feels punitive in that way. It's yeah. I, I as you're saying it, I'm realizing I think this way about other things. So mm-hmm. like, it's like a really parallel example would be like chores. Yeah. So if my mom says, "Hey, like I need you to go pick up the yard and weed whack," yeah, my brain thinks she wants she wants to build character. She thinks I'm she thinks I'm lazy. <laughs> she thinks yeah. I need more perseverance. She wants to teach me hard work. So she's making me do these things. Yeah. But when she says it, she goes, no, these things just need done. Right. And so, like, it, they're just things that are happening. They're natural natural outcomes of yes. living at the house and living in the yard. Yes. And the grass is growing because the sun's shining. Yes. And so, like, it's kind of the same where these are not, God isn't putting these, sometimes maybe, it may, I mean, but maybe. most of the time, he's not putting you through trials just say, like, you could do with some character building. Right, 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 it's right. It's like, these are, these are things that are happening, but I will take these situations, and you will grow through it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And actually, I mean, maybe if there's a theme in there, is that, like, neither, this feels super personal, neither your parents nor your God is constantly looking down and thinking nev- negatively about your character, right? They first and foremost love you are delighted in the creation that is in front of them. Um, do they, does God have an interest in saying, can I point you to the things that are the most of what I created you to be and to live righteously, to be part of the goodness of my kingdom and the fruits of those things? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so we'll point you to certain things and have you like, is it, there's a, um, we, God doesn't call us to be obedient to certain things because he likes obedience. He calls you to those things because they're good. Your mom doesn't have you weed whack the yard just because she wants to go, oh, I go to have an obedient daughter. The, the, to your point, the yard need weed whacked and you're capable of doing it. And frankly, it's it's it does help you to build good to build good character and weed whack your own yard some other time. You're used to hard work. You don't it doesn't become a disadvantage to you because you never did any decent work. Yeah. So like it's, I think it's flipping it's flipping what you believe authority figures are trying to get from you. Um they like first and foremost love you. They want what's best for you. They're trying to point you to good things. Does that result in built character? Sure, um, but it's not a it's not punitive to build character. It's it's good. But the some things to your point, they just need done. Like they're just part of they're just part of life. And then how do you? Well, at least I can build some character because I really hate weed whacking. That's probably it's a way to look at it, <laughs> right? It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Hey, you're listening live from the path. I maybe I'm interested. Do you? Do you have answers to either one of those two questions? And so, one, do you have um, – have you prayed in fearfully, I guess, worried? Have you hesitated to pray on anything? Um, yeah, and do you have anything about that that you'd be willing to share? And then secondly, like, do you remember a time or the time, maybe, if it's available to you, of when it felt like your faith became yours um, as opposed to just – Something like facts that you knew or things that people around you believed, and it felt autonomous from those things. You can um, hit us up on the Live from the Path complaint line. It's 515-517-0085. Call or text 515-517-0085. We did get a um, a submission on the old Live from the Path complaint line. We'll cover that next week uh, because I think the fellows would be interested in the take, and so we'll pick it up then. All right. We got through our one question. Congratulations. Success. All right, let's give out some advice, and then uh, and then we'll cut you guys loose. First, first one. Here we go. Um, dear, live from the path. I generally have an excellent relationship with my 14 year old granddaughter. However, she thinks it's funny to tell me outrageous lies with a straight face to see if she can get me to believe them. I know someone like that. Actually. I don't know what we're saying. She laughs when I am unsure of whether she is telling the truth. Uh, let's see here. Whoops. Once she told me her family was going to Hawaii for a month, she lives there with her father rather than with my daughter, so I'm not privy to his plans. Another time, she jerked her arms around and said she has tics. When I asked what she was talking about, she announced she had Tourette's syndrome. Both were untrue. I had epilepsy as a teenager, so I'm especially sensitive about a grandchild developing a neurological condition at the age I was. It felt like a cruel thing for her to do to me, and I was not amused. When I told her I didn't like it, she giggled and said, Oh, Grandma. I had arranged for her to do weekly yard work for me, but now I'm having second thoughts about having her around that often if she's going to purposely upset me like that. I sent a text to her mother telling her about it, 
but she received no response indicating she would talk to her daughter about it or have her oh but i received i received no mm-hmm. response indicating she would talk to her daughter about it or have her apologize what should i do humorless in iowa <sighs> well okay the uh the examples of the jokes that she's telling are not that funny right if Agreed. they were like actually outrageous lies like uh joe biden stopped by my house yesterday right, right those would be funny right so if she switches to funny stuff i don't see any harm with it yeah honestly like because the, the right now they're the sort of lies that like are just just uh they're not really outrageous lies they're just lies like, yes right it, it could be true if she actually lives part-time in hawaii is it really an outrageous lie to suggest her family is going there? Right. I right. don't think so. So, um, I think she needs to get a better sense of humor. I also think the grandma needs to grow tougher skin. <laughs> like, yeah. The the job of the grandchild is to be offended by things your grandparents say in mixed company, mm-hmm. not the reverse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I agree. That was my first reaction. Like, um. Like as like adults, you need to be adults here. Um, you don't have to let children push buttons. You get to control that. Uh, and so, like, here's the thing: I think there are consequences. Like, if a kid says something and you go, "Hey, is it th- I'm all for like an outrageous uh, deception that might be funny." Uh, our Pope style advice openings are always that. Okay, I'm willing to tell lies for the purposes of something that seems funny to me. But like, there's a difference that between that and I think to your point to like flat out deception. And like, I, I don't, do you expect your grandkid to be sensitive to whatever no. your neurological situation earlier? Like, okay. I mean, that's not, they wouldn't know that. And so the context, and frankly, I don't think you do any good by trying to guilt it up and overlaying on top of them. Like, did you know that I had this blah, blah, blah happen? Like, I just, it's not, it's not conceivable that they would know the difference. So like lay that off. But I think it is okay to like, to when someone's telling you some, let's say this kid tells you the story and you go, Hey. I'm going to ask you, like, that seems kind of wild. Is that true? If they're willing to lie to you and you find out about it, I, I, I don't have any problem going, look, I trust you less. Um, you're breaking trust with me. Like, I, now I don't know what to le- believe from you. And frankly, so, like, um, it makes it harder for us to have a good relationship. I think the kid's going to get over it. But, like, part of the, how they get over it is they recognize when they've crossed boundaries. They recognize when they've hurt somebody. And when it's not funny. Like, the main thing <laughs> where, like, right now my brother, he'll make – He'll make all weird sorts of weird faces and act like so f- weird when people come over because he thinks it's funny. He yes. thinks people are enjoying him. People are not. People right. are like, what is wrong with that kid? And someday he'll realize it and he'll stop. He'll give it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So, like, I, I don't know. I think advice here would be um, I don't like I don't think you have to be like a total killjoy here. But I, th- I think it is OK to say, look, these are not um, these are just lies. And I don't appreciate being lied to. And, um, you know, if that, I don't know that that impacts whether she can come over and do yard work at your place. Yeah, I mean. that's That seems punitive to me. Yeah. I don't think you need to do that. Um, but just, but like, I know you're not the parent, but I mean, grandparent her. It's okay to be a grandparent who gives good advice and says, look, I'm not mad because I'm an adult and I don't let you offend me. But like, that's not cool. And you're breaking trust with me, and you should be very cautious about how you protect how what people think of you and whether they trust you when you say things. Or like, pull like where she goes, yeah, we're going to Hawaii. You go, ah, oh, well, dang, I'm gonna have to return those airplane tickets I bought for us to go to Australia. <laughs> or, or if she goes, hey, uh, you know, I uh, we got a dog yesterday, and you go, yeah, I own a bear right now. I just never let you see it. Like, yeah, if you know that she is lying. Do like sh- it's not like give her a taste for old medicine because it's not like it's mean. Yeah, but it's like if you really think that these are these are obvious lies and they're making her look silly and you, they're so clearly seen through. Show her, show her because sometimes if you just tell them, they'll be like, "What? No, it's not. That's funny." Yeah, and so you're just like, "No, it's not, it's not funny." Yeah, right, right, agreed. Yeah, I think you can help teach a lesson. That's totally fine. I just my core recommendation would be. Pull some of your emotion out of it. I just, yeah. It's like you get to be the adult, be the adult, and do your best to help this person, this child, stop being offended by him. Uh, Secular says, try this, full colon. Tell your granddaughter you have bought tickets to a Taylor Swift or Harry Styles concert and ask if she would like to go with you. Then when she reacts, start laughing. It's kind of what I said, except yeah. 
colons used for lists. Yeah. Yeah, that was not that a... That was a mistake. That was a mistake. I Could agree. use a semicolon there. <laughs> you, just a, Unnecessary, but I suppose. <laughs> try this. Actually, you could just say... There's actually two colons. It says, dear humorless, full colon, try this, full colon. Okay, yeah, that's messed It's up. a double. Unnecessary. You could use commas there and be just fine. <laughs> okay, here we go. Dear... Why are all these people from Iowa? <laughs> this, this is cutting close to home. Like, we're not doing a good job keeping our shop in order. Dear Life in the Path, I am a 57-year-old, attractive, single, childless woman. Why is it that the men I meet are just plain dumb? <laughs> they have the conversational skills of five-year-olds and the same juvenile behavior. They are either emotionally unavailable and just after sex, or at the opposite end of the spectrum, available emotionally But this is just okay. Oh, I see. This is a promiscuous woman. I cannot be the first woman to ask the question, are boys just dumb? Yeah. (laughs) Like. (laughs) Emma says, of course. (laughs) How could you date this many men and not have come to this conclusion before? Yeah. I mean, I don't know why you necessarily think, like, if these are single dudes, which ideally they are. Ideally. Um. I don't like there's no been no situation for them to grow out of their dumbness. Mm, like mm-hmm. if they've been married, hopefully they've had some sort of like they've been in a relationship, they know how to deal with it. They know understand like what's what's needed. You need to be open, you need to be like you need to show more show more affection than you feel like is needed. You need to like like people people aren't reading your mind. Like you have to express things. Yeah. But um if they haven't I don't know if there's any reason to expect them to uh, to know that. Yeah, I mean, what if they've been to, I mean, they could be divorced, which means they suck at marriage probably. Yeah, yeah which <laughs> means clearly they're not very good at it. Yeah, you need a widower. You need someone who had a good run at it, and then unfortunately somebody passed away. This seems like someone you might be able to deal with. Although, like, again, I get, I get worried um, when she responds and says, well, yeah, some of them are available emotionally, but the sex is just okay. This means that you're actually having sex with people and not married to them and so you might be attracting the wrong types of guys because you're offering a life and and relationship of which the wrong types of guys feel attracted to right because like if i if something i value is a lady who values me and the purity of our relationship uh regardless of why i'm still single when i'm that age um if you're obviously not holding that same uh, standard or value, then I won't be the guy who's in a relationship with you. You're going to end up with the fellas who are okay with levels yeah. of promiscuity. Honestly, I just feel like this lady's hard to deal with. Like, <laughs> if I was a dude, I feel like I wouldn't be necessarily attracted to, to the 57-year-old lady who's like, honestly, I'm really pretty. I'm great. You should, you should. I don't understand how I keep getting these junk balls because I'm just perfect. <laughs> right. Like, she just seems kind of like... Hard person to deal with. Yeah, yeah, she does. I agree. Have the conversation skills of now. Here's where I will I will agree. Uh, I do think men are getting lazy, um, and they're not. Uh, there are a lot of men who like children who are parading around as fellas, um, and I think that is true. And I look around, and um, I, I do, I do. I don't wouldn't say I worry, but I, I look at this crop of fellas that I keep running into. And I'm like, I don't know, want to send my my daughters out into this world. These people. Like, they don't have their head on right. And then I think to myself, like, I probably was way worse than what my perception was. Like, I got I got married pretty young. My wife was even younger than me. And I thought, like, there's no way. There's no – I probably was a real – I don't know how my parents or grandparents, like, I probably looked as dumb as these people are looking to me. And so at some point, you got to wash your hands and go, I hope it works out. Like, everybody's immature. But, like, I, I, I would say I think there is a right assessment – around dudes in general are difficult. And I think at that position of life, it probably it does matter why they're single. But I think, Emma, to your point, um, if there's some, you, it lacks humility. If you're approaching them that you're the goods and that they should be otherwise, uh, and they, they, they are dumb, uh, well, if, if you're going to treat a man like that, the only guy who's willing to stay in a relationship with you is the wrong kind of man. Yeah. So. And there are, I feel like there are, there are multiple kinds of male dumbness. And maybe, maybe this changes as they age, but mm-hmm. like there's, there's kind of like what I'm just going to call like the teenage male dumbness where they're just going to do kind of crazy things. Mm-hmm. And you're like, that's kind of dumb, but I can laugh at that. That's pretty funny. Uh-huh. Like you're going to juggle or you're going to, you're going to play Nerf guns, but you're going to stick some matches in the, the, the tips. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it's a terrible idea guys, but I'll watch. <laughs> yeah. I'll just get some popcorn. Like this is pretty funny. Yeah. 
Um, and so I don't know. Wait, has that happened? No, I was okay. just I just saw <laughs> that on top of my head. Okay. <laughs> um, but like, is that is this the kind of thing, or or is it the kind where they're just kind of like they can't, yeah, can't hold a conversation. They're just kind of staring at you. Yeah. I they don't really know what to do with themselves because those are like those one you probably don't find funny at her age. Yeah. The Nerf guns you probably you would not find entertaining. Agreed. Um, and I wouldn't expect that out of these dudes. The other, I feel like I would expect, and you also don't have to find entertaining, but maybe have some sympathy for, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think, like, in any relationship, like, um, you, they are individual people, and they get to be themselves. And, I mean, it's okay. It's okay to, you know, if you're dating people and you're not finding the right guys, that's okay. But, like, if it's everybody, then it's you. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I, the, the other question would be like, how are you meeting these people? Where are you meeting them? Like, is it likely you're finding a, a sharp guy? Are you picking them up at the bar? Or are you picking them up at places of which like, if, if you know, you got to go, you got to go where the right types of fellows are at. And so which types of fellows are the right types of fellows who are most likely to react to you in a positive way? Well, uh, you got to uh, one, are you looking from the right place? And then two, like we talked about earlier, uh, are you offering the types of things that the right type of people want? Actually, I saw a clip. um on Facebook the other day, and it was a, just an interview with like they were talking about that men valued women who hadn't um, who who like valued the the sanctity of their relationship, right? Who mm-hmm. were not like going out with a, a million other dudes, and like these ladies were dumbfounded. We're like, I don't know, a guy shouldn't be able to care. Like he shouldn't have any say into that. That's not really his business. Uh, we get to kind of do what we want. And then they kind of went through the same thing. We're like, well, what's your ideal man? And the guy, dude was making, needed to make $200,000 a year, had to be taller than them, had to be like two or three other things. And they're like, that's 0.2% of the population. Yeah. So like your standards are ridiculous. Well, I think, you know, I think, I think this is a book lady. I think this lady loves books. And so she's looking for the ideal book dude, mm. which is like good looking, probably either rich or super poor, but it doesn't really matter because it's going to turn out fine anyways. <laughs> Um, probably has all sorts of skills, pretty yeah. smart, and can handle either a sword and or gun reasonably. <laughs> like, she's just not going to find that. Yeah. Yeah. She might be. Yeah. She's and, either- can, and can hold smart, intellectual conversation without pause because someone was writing this. This is like these, these sentences you're reading on the page are not, they're not an actual conversation. Yes. Agreed. Now, here's, there's one thing I'm going to say, uh, and, uh, let's see, age. Okay. Age appropriate. Here's, here's what I'm going to say. Her her measure is emotionally available, or do I like physical act, uh, physical sexual activity with this person? Here's what I'm going to tell you. You find the right person in the right relationship who you are safe in, who you love, who you connect with. Um, the physical part will work itself out when you trust each other. And so, like, the problem is, is, like, you've got two things as if you're measuring them against each other. If you get the love part right, if you get the trust part right, the other part will come with it just fine. And so, again, I, I think you're looking too shallow. I think you are being too shallow. And so I, I think it's unlikely. And I, I, it's a hard pool for to find the right dudes. I, I grant that. But, like, you're going to have a much harder time. Uh, I don't think you're fishing in the right ponds. And I don't think you're offering the right bait for the type of guy that you want. Secular says, as a matter of fact, oh, the last thing they had said, uh, I cannot be the first woman to ask the question, are boys just dumb? Secular says, as a matter of fact, you are the first. With the advent of social media, people's social skills began declining. The men you are meeting may not have have the same level of education that you do, but it doesn't mean they are dumb. Men ultimately want what women want, I think. By that, I mean a companionship, a relationship, and uh, physical activity. You might have better luck if you try to meet men whose values more closely mirror your own. I don't know about that. I don't like your values. I, that was my yeah. own side commentary. <laughs> uh, do some volunteering. Take a class or join a group activity you enjoy. Okay. As to your disappointment in the uh, performance of the men in your past who are emotionally available, unnecessary full colon. Boy, they're on fire today. Try to remember that men are teachable creatures and often eager to please if you are willing to communicate what you need. That is true, for every, even beyond the sexual stuff. Perhaps the problem is that those communication skills could use some polishing. Well, since I'm in Dan's chair, let me just straighten my Hawaiian shirt and say, first of all, you guys need to get Jesus in the middle of this relationship. <laughs> yep. Agreed. Agreed. And like, here's the thing. Like, if you start there, you just have a common set of things of which relationship can stuff can go easier. I know it's not perfect. Plenty of Christian marriages have all kinds of trouble. But like, at, like at least you know the premise of which you're starting some stuff. And so, 
Yeah, I just, it feels like a real Wild West without that. I don't know. It just seems real difficult. All right, last one. Here we go. Dear, live from the path. I am a 16-year-old girl who is struggling to have a social life. Oh, since I was a little girl, I've had a problem connecting with kids my own age. I have done better with kids older or younger than me. A lot of times I relate better with teachers than with students. The few friends I had before COVID-19 have vanished into thin air. When school started, I was part of a new group of friends, but it didn't last long. The groups in my school are very tight. It's almost impossible to break into an already existing friend group. While I don't mind being alone, I know I'm missing out. It doesn't help that I don't know how to approach other teens and that I suffer from anxiety that makes me doubt myself when I try. I also can't express myself clearly because I'm not from this country. Ooh, twist. English is not my first language, and there are cultural things I can't understand. Do you have any advice uh, so I can approach people easier and maybe make a friend or two? So, uh, I feel like I could say I'm half in this person's boots and half wearing my own shoes Mm -hmm. because uh, I am homeschooled and I was born in this country and English is my native and only language. Uh Um, But I do, I think I can understand um, having a hard time connecting with people. Like, you're not really sure what to say. You're like, everything that comes to your head, you're like, you'll say it and you'll be like, that's a group, so I should say that. And then... you you realize, oh no, I shouldn't say that. Yeah. Or you think of one good thing to say and you're like, I'm going to say it. And then you hold on to that for like 10 minutes and then the conversation's over. You can't say that anymore. And so you spent the whole conversation <laughs> waiting to say it. Yeah. Um, or you don't feel like you share any common interests. And um, that definitely was me and could still be me in some ways. Um, and so I don't really know from personal experience, there wasn't really anything I did to fix it so like i um there was lots of friend groups at the the co-op i go to there's like friend groups um i didn't really know anybody when i first came i didn't really talk to anybody kind of just stuck to myself eight i was the only one at a solo table and i ate lunch by myself every day mm-hmm. and that was also most of last year but then i uh joined basketball and there's a lot of basketball girls who go there so then eventually they just invited me over and they said, hey, do you want to sit with us? And for like the first five weeks, I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm just going to sit here and eat my lunch. I can maybe I can write. I can text my cousin. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm OK. Yeah. Um, and then eventually I just I ended up sitting with them. And then since then they invited me in and I sat and I accepted. And so since then, I've just sat there. So like even when other people haven't, I, that's that's the table I sit at now. Um, And like throughout people have invited me to sit with them before like even if i'm at that table they go hey we're gonna eat on the stage like do you want to come sit over there yeah i'll be like oh thanks or sure or no thanks maybe next week um and so like that wasn't really anything i did i just got lucky i happened to be introduced in an extracurricular activity with these girls and so if you really there's something like you're interested in and i wouldn't say basketball is even necessarily an interest or a passion of mine it's just something i happened to be in i enjoyed it and i saw these girls two to three times a week consistently yeah and so you naturally form if not like solid friendships then acquaintances who you can who are friends in certain situations yeah um and so you could either you could start by finding like a an interest there's always people unless you have well, unless you go to a tiny school, there's always people with your interest yeah. of one kind or another. Or you have no interests, which <laughs> makes you kind of hard to deal with. you yeah. got to be interested in something. So it could be music. It could be drama. It could be like technology, sports. There's all so, so many kinds of sports. It could be writing. It could be even video games. Like there's there's always somebody. And then the other thing that helped was that I have a group of three or four girls who go to our church and youth group and are like my closest friends. And like, so I always have them. Mm -hmm. So even if I don't see people from basketball or I don't have any friends at the school that I go to, like I know I will see them at church and I'll see them at youth group and I can text them throughout the week. And so like they, they will always be there. And so like, you don't even, I think a lot of times there's a pressure to um, have a big friend group like have as many friends as you can be part of like, be part of a crowd. It doesn't matter what crowd it doesn't have to be the popular crowd, but uh-huh. be a part of a crowd. Yeah. And I don't think it's necessarily, that's really always necessary. Like it's nice. And if that's your personality where you want a crowd, 
um, I think you should try to find it. But if you haven't had a crowd by now and you don't know how to find it, you're probably not a person who necessarily wants to be in one. Yeah. Um, so even finding a few people who you know or you already know or you know you share interests with or see them frequently would be great. And like I started with my cousin who I know who has to like me. We're mm-hmm. family. Has to, see, has to see me. Yeah. We, she can't escape it. And so, and we've known each other from young enough age that there, she has not, she has not experienced like, uh, masked or put on Emma yeah. or like friends I've met other places have. Yeah. Even like the friends I've grew up with starting from age three have, because I just automatically when I'm with them start shifting to act more like them. Yeah. Say the things they say. I'm interested in the things they are, or at least I pretend to be. And my cousin just, hey, she never, she's never gotten that for me. We just because of how we grew up or when we saw each other or stuff like that. Yeah. And so finding someone who you've never had to do that with, I think is really good starting point because then once you're with your, your full self with at least that one person, the people around you will get to see your full self and they'll probably, they'll, they'll enjoy it. And so then you will automatically gain more friends through that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I think um, one of the biggest fears that people have about making friends um is the fear of like of rejection right that someone you're gonna try to introduce yourself you're gonna try to make a friend and someone's gonna like total high school movie thing where like uh no we don't want to be a friends with you because you're a loser and uh, your dad's our pool boy or whatever okay and so here's the he, he, one of the key things to remember is that like the type of people that would do that to you or think that about you are jerk people who you don't want as friends anyway. Yeah. Like the worst thing to do is give control and authority over your life to the type of person who would react that way. And so frankly, be optimistic, be willing to, I, I think joining various things for, for practical reasons. Like I think you should go there and meet Jesus at the old church and youth group. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to tell you this, they want you there. People are excited to be there. Lots of food. Christians believe that they're supposed to welcome other people to the church functions. And so they're going to say, hi, how you doing? My name is Lola. Uh, What's your name? (laughs) Like, it's just a great place to meet people because Jesus forms good communities of people. And like, they're welcoming. And like, here's, so anyway, I, I think that's a great option is just find things that you enjoy and start meeting people that way. I don't know how, what did she say? How old she was? 16. Okay. Yeah. I try Get a part-time job. You know, the, like I had uh, a pretty narrow group of friends when I was growing up, like uh, pe- just based upon the things that I liked or liked to do or whatever. Uh, I wasn't super, I didn't get along with people. I, it wasn't antagonistic, but like I didn't, I was awkward, I think. And so I just had a very small friend group. Um, when I started working though, it was interesting. Um, the first job that I had was a Godfather's Pizza and like some of the more popular ladies in school, like not just my grade, but like two grades above, worked as the the ladies up front. And like I'm back there making pizzas and stuff. And like, uh, I mean, I wasn't trying to date any of them or anything, but like, I mean, I was. We were friendly. We got to. Meet, I know them. They know me. I would. I would recognize them now. They would say hello. Um, and it's weird how situations break down perceived barriers. All the barriers at high school are fake. I I get that they're real for then. It feels like they're real in that moment, but they're not really real. Like as soon as I remember thinking this, as soon as I graduated, like everything that felt like they were unique and interesting distinctions about cliques and groups of people, it was all gone. It belonged to the building and it belonged to my perception of that. And I didn't particularly care, but like it just felt like it was arbitrary. And so my encouragement is, is one, uh, don't be afraid to, um, to, to try to make friends. If if someone rejects you, you're glad to know it. Uh, they're jerky people anyway. You don't want them as friends. But to be honest with you, people, this is true for even, even in the high school realm or just in general, um, people are attracted to sometimes like boyfriend, girlfriend stuff, but sometimes just friend stuff. They're attracted to people who like them. So like uh, you got that uh, fella or lady that you're after, you're trying to catch their eye. Find a way without pouring your whole soul onto the world to like make it clear to them that like, hey, you you think they're good people, right? P- 
people, <laughs> you get like a 10% bonus bump. Okay. You get to be the small Luigi and become the big Luigi simply yes. for going up to somebody and going, Hey, uh, and, and making it clear to them that you think something nice about them. Love Luigi. This is what I'm saying. So like, it, it just is the case. So like, just be a nice person, compliment people, say kind things to people. They will start noticing over time. So um, I, it's, it kind of feels like all the things, um, be open on your expectations. Don't, um, I wouldn't just micro target a single person, just be you. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that, that part is important too. Like, um, it's okay. It's okay to change, to feel like your personality shifts in front of different people. It's that, that's an honoring thing, right? You change a little bit because this friend group likes to talk about these things in this way. I, it's not, you're not being fake. You're just, you're kind of tuning to something that makes sense in that particular context. That's okay. But for heaven's sakes, be yourself. There's no reason to carry a weight of a facade of who you are. But like, I don't know, if if you're going to be yourself, make sure yourself is a nice person who cares about people. <laughs> and it, it feels to people or like to us who are, who are either awkward or anxious or like just don't know what to do or even like shy or whatever. It feels crazy to think that there these people exist, but there are always people out there who are willing to come up and talk to you and who are actually kind yes. and good people. Like, I was in a band. Um, this wasn't even a homeschool band. It was a public school band of probably 50 kids. And I only came for band, so I came in and I played the, the only... I was the only person playing the stand-up bass in the back of the room, and then I left. And I always had a hat on, and I always had a mask on. I made no eye contact. I said nothing to nobody. I remember pretty much one person's name yeah. and I remember his name cause he came up and talked to me. Yeah. Like I, I was avoiding people. Yeah. I was actively giving off and kind of purposefully like, I'm just here for, I'm here to play the bass that you can't hear. And then I'm out of here. Yeah. Like I am, I am, I'm not here to make friends because I'm not good at it or I don't want them or whatever. And he, he came up and he talked to me anyways. And then he kept talking to me. Oh, Hey, how's this thing going? Oh, are you wearing a Minecraft shirt? That's really cool. I love Minecraft. Yeah. What have you been building lately? And the next time I was there, he goes, oh, have you seen the new update? And it's like, there, there are always those people. Yeah. Whether you see them or not. And like, even you even try to push them away sometimes and they'll just <laughs> be there. Yeah. And sometimes it's annoying and sometimes it's like, thank goodness. And I, I did not appreciate you when I, like, then you'll leave and you're like, thank goodness that guy was there. Cause otherwise it would have been really depressing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And like one of the ways you can do it too is 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 realize that um there might be other people like you. Like other people who are having so look for the people who are sitting by themselves and say, Hey, do you mind if I sit by you? I mean, we might as well sit by ourselves together. Right? Like just have some confidence and keep trying and like those things will work out. Just try not to be deterred by the wrong by the wrong people. There's always a risk in in people reacting negatively to you, but like it is so it is much smaller than what you think. It feels like a bigger rock to get over than it is. All right, you've been listening to Life from the Path. Uh hey, if you got any feedback for us on the show this week, um uh, please let us know. 515-517-0085. You can call or text and send it to the Bob Eisenhower Live from the Path complaint line and we'd love to uh, get your thoughts, your answers on the big question. Maybe we got the advice totally wrong and you'd like to chastise us about it. That seems totally fair. 515-517-0085. With, uh, yeah, that's the uh, Bob Eisenhower Life from the Path complaint line. I think we're going to tuck it up. We got through our big question and three advices. So thanks so much for hanging out with us tonight. Emma, thanks for coming in and holding the fort. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you when we see you. In the meantime, be faithful in the means. God will handle the end. You've been listening to Live from the Path.